everybody, welcome back. We're about to be in our third talk. Uh, I think this is really cute that all of a sudden I see a whole bunch of crosswords out there and also a whole bunch of smartphones and iPads. Uh, is that cheap? Is that cheating? If they use the internet, it's totally cheating. That's cheating. Okay, just so you know. Um, our next speaker is going to talk about the art and science of crosswords. Uh, he is named Stephen Riley, but he has a nickname that makes no sense relative to his rest of his name, which is Ringo. Okay, they finished it. Wow, very impressive. All right, well, in his talk, he will tell you if you're right, so please welcome to the stage, Steve Ringo Riley. So who, um, who's finished? You guys? Uh, anybody else need any answers really quick? Before we start? A hollow gun? Okay. At the end of it, there will be that. Uh, who does crossword puzzles sort of on a daily or weekly basis here? Okay, that's a good number. Uh, does anybody else here construct? Crickets. Okay, so I guess I'm the only one. Um, yeah, so I'm just supposed to talk here and make it not awkward. Am I doing that? <laughs> All right. Shut up. Okay, there's a lot of stuff, surprisingly large amount of stuff, that can be said about crosswords, and uh, I really need to pare down my talk because of that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the the thing about crosswords is because there's such a tight number of constraints when you construct them is that the aesthetics and the technical components are very tightly linked. And I'm only going to be able to go into a little bit of that, I'm going to hit a little bit sliver of that, and then we're going to try to show you how these two things are linked within crosswords. Okay, so to start off, I mean, you've all got crosswords in front of you, but this is a crossword. This guy right here is Brendan Emmett Quigley. He is a sort of a big shot on the screen, uh, well, in, in the puzzle world. He's kind of funny looking. He's got his own website. But yeah, this is a pretty good puzzle, and I'm going to try to show you why it's a good puzzle as opposed to all the other ones like mine, which suck. Okay, uh, these are the rules, a lot of words. Uh, the main thing I'm going to be focused on is this one right here. No two-letter words, no unchecked letters. That is what really makes an American crossword a American-style crossword, as opposed to a Japanese or a British or a Swedish-style crossword. Um, oh, sorry. Unchecked means that you don't have here. Let me show you unchecked. Right here. Okay. That is an unchecked letter. It's part of a downward, but not a cross. Anyway, this is Will Shorts' face. <laughs> Any talk about aesthetics and crosswords has to touch on all four of these. Again, I don't have enough time. So we're only going to talk about entries. Uh, if you have questions about clues, themes, or grids, we can talk about that at the end of the Q&A session. Okay, because this is an aesthetic question, we have to ask the question, whose opinion matters? Whose opinions matter? Give you a hint, it's not mine. In order to answer this question, let's talk about this distinction right here, the domain and the field. So the domain is the stuff. The field is the people who study this stuff. So in crosswords, the domain is like the stuff, the building them, the doing them, the words, all that kind of stuff. The field is the people who say things about it and shape opinion. In the field, you've got publishers, editors, and critics. The top two, publishers and editors, are gatekeepers. And then the people at the bottom right here, the critics, Waldorf and Statler, are the ones who shape public opinion. Number one person, obviously Will Shorts. Uh, if you know anything about crosswords, you know who he is. If you don't, I recommend watching the movie Wordplay. Number two guy, this guy's less known in the real world. This is Michael Sharp, AKA Rex Parker, at least in my opinion, he's the number two guy. So he has a blog, millions of visitors a day. He is very vehement about what he likes and he doesn't like. So he reaches a lot of people and convinces a lot of people. All right, number three and four and five and six. You've got two more constructors here, Rich Norris and Peter Gordon. Um, they edit the LA Times and the Firewall Crosswords. If New York Times is too easy for you, Go to the Fireball Crosswords. New York Times is too hard. Go to the LA Times. Uh, by the way, if Will Short suddenly dies, my guess is that Peter Gordon, the second one right there, who will come up later in this talk as well, would be the one to secede him. So he's probably the suspect. 
Uh, and you've also got these other critics, Dem Ablin, Dem Am, Deb Amlin, Amy Ronaldo, and a couple of other people. So, if we wanted to uh, see, sort of, this is the field. What what do we know about these people? They are extremely intelligent, first of all. Uh, they are um, they're very educated and apparently all nearsighted because <laughs> they all wear glasses. But most importantly, they see a ton of puzzles every day, somewhere between five and fifty. I heard something that you know, Will Sharts gets something like five hundred billion puzzles a week that he has to say no to. Uh, all right. So bringing it back to this, this idea of the field, we can say, what makes a good entry? All right, uh, we don't, we all know about pop music, right? So we can ask this question about something that we know about. What makes a good pop song? Uh, you know, and, and because we are familiar with pop songs, we can sort of put ourselves in the shoes of people who see these crosswords every day, and we can, we can sort of, you know, have, have a good idea of what they think. So anybody remember this guy? <laughs> And can anybody do the dance? Yeah. <laughs> I've got a little bag of positive reinforcement in here, so it was that was you, sir. Oh, sorry, I hit that I hit someone else in the head. All right, uh, I'm gonna stop that now. Yeah, that was negative. I think that was positive punishment. Is what that was. First time you heard this song, you're probably like, oh yeah. What's this? I don't understand the words, but it makes me feel nice. And you like jump around and do stuff. But like the hundredth time you heard it, you're like, dude, this guy needs to get off the radio. <laughs> so entries are like this. We can put words on a graph. So in, we've got in real life usage down here, basically what people know, what makes them react. And on the other axis, we've got crossword usage. So we can start putting words here. So like Gangnam Style. This is something everybody knows now because of that stupid song. But it's never shown up a crossword puzzle as of yet. Uh, at least a well-published one. On the opposite side, we've got something like the word ear, E-R-E. -E. Nobody ever uses this word in real life, but I think there's a law that says every crossword puzzle has to have it. Uh, a word that shows up in real life and crosswords a lot would be something like area codes, where you keep your hose. And then on the opposite end, you've got something like Zweeback, which is a word that like, never shows up in real life or in crossword puzzles. It showed up in like one New York Times puzzle. Anybody know what Zweeback is? Yeah! Where are my crackers? You know what crackers are. <laughs> so, based on these four prototypes, we can construct four major categories. So, something like area codes would be in what we call the bread and butter fill. Here would be crossword ease, which is a word that is near and dear to every constructor's heart. Obscure words, and then new and shiny words like Gangnam Style. Uh, all right, so before we move on to describing these things, I'd like to talk about scrabbliness. This is a common rating in crossword puzzles. Um, so those of you who play Scrabble know that not all letters are created equal. Those words that are harder to get into a word have more point values. Those that are easy to use have lower point values. So those things that are, are hard are sort of more well received in, in crossword puzzles. The ones that aren't are, well, not. All right, bread and butter fill. If this were an animal, it would be a beaver. It, because it's small, it is hard working, and it's not much to look at. So this is sort of the... Oh, man. Seriously. Oregon State, is that right? Wait, what? Whatever. Um, okay, so uh, unless the majority of the words in your puzzle are, are like this, you're probably doing it wrong. Okay, uh, crossword ease would be like a baby skunk. Cute if there's a little bit of it, but like you spend too much time around a baby skunk and it starts to smell really bad. So this is this common knowledge. So I've heard a lot of people as I'm walking around say, oh, I can't do crosswords, oh, I can't do them. This is probably because you don't know this stuff. And this stuff shows up, shows up in all the puzzles. And this is what I really want to talk about in terms of the, uh, the relationship between the aesthetics and the technical stuff. Okay, so here's some common crossword ease. You've got stuff like ETA, INRE, SSR, foreign words that nobody uses, American words, well, English words that nobody uses, you got all these other things, geography, Roman numerals, stuff that really doesn't look very good in a puzzle but shows up all the time. Now the question is why? Okay, so here's a puzzle with a lot of crosswordies in it. I've tried to 
pick out some of it. You got SSTs, you got Esta, Yano, Olivers, Tarit, ERs, Casa. This is not stuff that we use on a day-to-day -day basis, but it shows up in crosswords all the time. Okay, time for a quiz. Who knows what this word means? Etui. Yes, yes ma'am. Exactly! It's where you keep your supplies. Here's your negative reinforcement. <laughs> Alright, who else wants to try to answer a question? Who knows what an ala is? I think I'm pronouncing that right. Yes! Yes! It's an earthenware cooking pot. Very nice. Wait, is that what you said or was it something else? Whatever. Calm down. This would be the obscure stuff. So if the obscure stuff were an animal, it'd be this thing. I don't know what it is. It's crazy. It might be a bat or a marsupial or I don't know. From another planet. Anyway, so you use it, you put it in there, and it's fun, it's crazy, it's quirky, and it's unexpected. It can really make a puzzle more memorable. So here's some examples of that. Zarf. Alright, who knows what a zarf is? Don't raise your hand, Luke. Yes? It's a scarf for a zebra. Shut up. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. Okay, so when I first heard this, I totally thought it was like... <laughs> like Batman sound. Zarf. Uh, but in reality, it is a coffee cup holder from the Arabic for coffee cup holder. I don't know. <laughs> Apparently they use this word on submarines a lot. Alright, this is Patrick Barry. He's one of the greatest crossword puzzle creators alive. Here he is using the word syzygy. Anybody know what syzygy is? Yes! It is an alignment of planets or a pairing of deities. Very good, sir. Do you want your negative reinforcement? Alright, here you go. I gotta tell you, I'm really bad at this. <laughs> Fourth category, new and shiny. Now this stuff is awesome. This would be like the honey badger of, <laughs> of crossword puzzles. So this can be borderline inappropriate. It makes you feel something, but it can also be dangerous because if you go too far down that road of slang and weirdness and inappropriateness, then you can get a puzzle rejected because you've done that. And I'll try to show you an example of that. Okay. For instance, here is... <laughs> this is Peter Gordon. I talked about him before. In case you don't know what vajazzling is. There, there's vajazzling. Excuse me? I don't know. I run a parlor that does this. That, that there is the face of a man who will vajazzle you. Alright, this is Lynn Lempel. She likes to use words that get her in trouble. So, scumbag, right? This is a great word. We love using the word scumbag. It means something. This is what we think a scumbag is, right? That's scumbag Steve right there, right? Does anybody know the origin of the word scumbag? Condom! Yes! Condom! So, a lot of nerds got very upset when this was in a puzzle, and so it's never shown up since. How this one made it past the censors, I have no idea. I couldn't find a picture for Martin Schneider, but I assume he looks like Sean Connery, because this was the clue. Yeah. You know a fetish might guy. Okay, so speaking of dick jokes, this is a puzzle that I made. It got rejected from everywhere. This is my Dick Clark tribute puzzle for when he died. I know, I'm terrible. So anyway, yeah, you go too far down this, you're gonna get a puzzle rejected. Alright, putting it all together, this is Nate Last. He's one of the young guns of crosswording world. He got his first puzzle puzzle when he was about 16 years old. Here he is showing us how it's done. How do we pronounce five across up there? Flavor! 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 
<laughs> right, it's really fun to say. And then the other stuff, you got I Am America, which is Stephen Colbert's book. You got Spice Girls, you got Lap Dances, Fist Bump, and a word I love, which is frittata. <laughs> Sweet deal, you got down here in the, in the other stuff. Anyway, so this is what you want a puzzle to look like. PTL? I don't know. Praise the Lord. There you go, praise the Lord. That's a symbol for you. Okay. So that was the aesthetic stuff. Now on to the technical stuff. You can all leave now if you don't want to see this. Okay, so I... Yeah, let me go back to that, actually. So I, uh, I approach this from just crossword constructing from a technical point of view. I'm not really an artist. Um, my background is in math and computer science. So I, unlike Luke, am really bad with language. I, my real goal was to try to figure out how to fill a crossword grid efficiently. So let's ask this question. How hard is it? That's what she said. <laughs> So everybody, I know you've all got paper, I know you've got pencils. What I'd like you to do is turn those over and draw a three by three grid like this. Try to figure out a way of putting in some words together that make all the crosses and all the downs work. So you don't have to finish it right now. I'm gonna just keep on going. But you know, work on it for a second so you can get a feel for it. So this is mine. <laughs> Oh, you want to see it? You can't use this one. <laughs> Ass. All right, here's another shibboleth for you. Who knows what NP complete means? Yeah, yeah, you all studied computer science in college, I'm sure. Anyway, so grid filling is an NP complete problem. Now, what that means, for those of you who don't know, is that as the grid becomes big, this quickly gets out of hand. As you, like, if you were to double the grid size, you wouldn't double the difficulty, you would multiply it by like a factor of 10 to the 100th power or something like that. Okay, so grid filling depends on the grid, depends on the lexicon, and it also depends on the distribution of letters in the lexicon. And this might not be a fully understood thing. It might not, might not be obvious, so I'm gonna tell you a story. Okay, so... <laughs> There's this country that no one really talks about between Estonia and Russia, and it's called what the fuck is Stan? And about half the people live in the capital. Oh my God, what the fuck is Stan? Anyway, so basically, these people are just offended and surprised at everything that happens. So they really only need one thing to express their feelings, which is the Interrobe. And I think it's pronounced. Hmm? <laughs> so the number of interrobangs represents the amount of what the fuck that they're trying to express. So for instance, this would be like a hmm. This and then Does everybody recognize that? Where's your, here's your negative reinforcement? No, you can get it after the show. Okay, now the good thing is that in this language, it is very easy to fill a crossword because they only have really one effective letter. Now all of these things, I'm not gonna show you what the clues look like because those are terrible. They're just little pictures of terrible stuff. Uh, all right, so the reason why it's so easy is because there's a 100% chance that if you cross two words at a certain point that they're going to have the same letter there. This brings me to a number that I refer to as alpha. So alpha is the percentage chance that if you take a language and you cross them, uh, you take a lexicon and you pick two uh, words at random, cross them at a random point, you get the same letter. Here we are trying to cross Jay-Z and Queasy, but that doesn't work because you've got a Y in one and you've got an A in the other. Okay, so generally, what is this? We need to know something about the way that letters are used in English in order to calculate this value. This is, I took this from Wikipedia. This is a graph. Uh, I hope you know how to read it. So from this, we can calculate the percentage chance that two words are going to match. A certain point is 0 0.067. All right, now who cares? So interpreting this value, 0 0.067, for English, uh, it turns out that the reciprocal of alpha, something I call beta, is the works as the effective number of characters. So if you have a language that has 
10 characters that are all evenly used, it will have a beta value of 10. Here are some selected beta values that I've calculated. You've got what the fuck is Danny, which has one. Down at the bottom you have Polish, 24. They have a lot of vowels and they use them in really weird ways. Uh, in the middle is English, beta value about 15. My compiled lexicon has a slightly higher value than that. All right, so let's use these numbers that we've figured out to ask the question, how many solutions are possible to this? How many ways can we do this? All right, how many fills are possible? First, let's talk about some terminology. So this is what I call a cover. So a cover is when you have words that work to the left or right or up and down. I picked these words completely at random just to show you what this is. So if you have something that works as a cover left and right and a cover up and down, this is a fill. So this is one where left, right, up and down, all the words work, except some of them are bad, so don't tell me about that. Why does this number matter? You ever go to the grocery store and someone's picked over all the fruit? All that's left is the crap at the bottom. So the more fruit, the more chance you can find something good. So the more that you can create, the more puzzles you can create, the higher chance you're going to be able to create a good puzzle. So here we can see that with a you know five by five grid, uh, the number of fills that you can create is tightly dependent on alpha. You change alpha just a little bit, and there's a huge number of order of magnitude difference between these things. Hawaiian 10 to the 17th fills for a 5x5 five five grid, Polish 10 to the 6th. Also, how hard we have to look is very dependent on alpha. So for Hawaiian, 1 in 400 fills will also be a cover. Excuse me, 100 uh, covers will also be a fill in Polish you're 12 orders of magnitude off on that. Okay, so this is how, as the grid size increases, what we can expect. So remember how we are saying that, that this is an NP-complete problem? These exponents are increasing quadratically. So that is a very out-of-control problem. In fact, it's pretty much impossible to create an 8 by 8 fill. Okay, so you guys have done really good looking at all these numbers. So here's some pictures of baby animals. <laughs> All right, enough of that. Okay, to sum up, why is cross reduce so prevalent? You take your lexicon, you juice it by 10%, and you get 1,700 times as many fills. So this is why you can add a whole bunch of little words that are used very rarely with very common letters, and you're going to get a huge increase in the number of ways that you can fill out a grid. Also, it makes it much easier to find one. Okay, so that's pretty much it for this. Uh, Cross excuse me, what? Crosswordies. What about it? That's it. That's what? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Am <laughs> oh, I on drugs? <laughs> okay, I'd like to thank some people. Uh, this is my lovely fiance, Erica, uh, without whom I would never have made my first crossword puzzle. She um, was unable to not fight crime tonight, so she could make it. This is Ian. He keeps me full of coffee. He's my roommate. Hi, Ian. Are you there? Yes. <laughs> uh, he did all the art in here, so you know, if you need a graphic designer, go to him, and he'll give me a 10% finder fee. This is Luke, you already met him. This is what he looks like with his shirt off. Uh, he convinced me to do this, and he helped me edit and pare it down. This is Charlie and Lauren. They wrote all those clues that you guys are, are having problems with that I heard. Um, and yeah, anyway, it's impossible to have a conversation with these people because it just degenerates into a battle of who can make the worst pun. For that reason, they're great crossword clue writers, but terrible to talk to. Uh, Xwordinfo.com, this is where I got the data, pictures of constructors, curated by Jim Horn, that guy's awesome. Go to this website if you have any questions about crosswords and crossword data. Also donate there. Also donate to Wikipedia. I stole some stuff from there. Uh, and also, a big round of applause for Bart and Lucy.
and to the rickshaw stop for letting us have this by beer tip well. Okay, and as of that, Q&A. Here's a list of uh, things I didn't get to, so if you want to ask about those. Yes, ma'am. So the question is if there is an objective metric for determining whether or not. Uh, no, there is not. Uh, I wish there were, but that would require a lot of data and a lot of, it would basically be an AI hard problem figuring it out, I think. Is that the right word for it, Meg? Yeah, thanks. So it's essentially subjective. Right, and also there's a lot of variability between people. Some people get stuff. So like I showed that puzzle by Nate and Last with Flavor Flav and I Am America and all that stuff. People my age would get that, but people who were 80 would not. I think. Yes, sir. What's your typical approach for starting to compose a puzzle? Uh, I am a, f uh, the, the question is, uh, what is my approach for starting to compose a puzzle? So I'm a themeless puzzle creator. That's what I really like. And so basically that just focuses on wide open grids and fun words to put in. So basically I'll be walking down the street and I'll see something like, oh, Sasquatch. be a great word to put in the puzzle. Oh, the joy of sex. Let's put that in a puzzle, you know? Something like that. So really that's what it is. I just wait for an inspiration to strike. Then it is always a... It is, it is a balance between what works and what looks good, you know, and you always have to sort of straddle that line. Ringo, up here. Ian! No, no, there's other people. Oh. Uh, you pick one of them. I don't know who's other. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, editor, yeah. uh, Hi. what do you mean by caching technique? Yeah. Okay. So it's important to be able to hold um, this. So, all right. You really want to get into this? Okay. So the grid filling algorithm right here. It's important to be able to do certain things over and over and over again. This, okay, so, oh my god. I'm not gonna do this. Talk to me afterwards. <laughs> uh, okay, really? Really? Okay, to fill a grid, the way I do it, and this is a this is a algorithm that I built on my own. I didn't. Uh, I, I don't know how anybody else does it. But basically, what you do is you look at the horizontal covers, the vertical covers. You say what is the smallest of the two, which is the smallest size, horizontal cover, vertical cover. And this is for a specific patch. So then, what you do is you put in a word, then you ask about it again. Usually, the perpendicular. Now, so the result is that you end up asking for the same sets of words over and over again. So basically, it's important to be able to cash on patterns that you see. So like maybe blank A, blank, blank E, or something like that. So it's important to be able to run these, these, uh, these patterns past each other and be able to know when a pattern is a sub-pattern of something else. So basically what you want to be able to do is cache it efficiently so that when you ask for a certain pattern, you're also being able to do it in a tree sort of format. I don't know, whatever. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> Excuse me? No, this is software I wrote. Yes, sir. Uh, what's the largest grid that's been filled in English? The largest grid that I filled? Or anybody uh, the biggest one, the, this is the question about the biggest grid that's been The biggest one I know of covers an entire wall with about one centimeter wide squares. It's something you can buy on like one of those Sky Mall magazines or something like that. Uh, I don't, I've not done it. I imagine it's terrible. Anybody else? Yes. By hand, adding gear, or to make it, uh, it is very possible to do it by hand. And in fact, before about 1990, most people did it by hand. Not not anymore now that you've got sort of like faster and faster computers coming out. There are people, and in fact, one of the people that I invited tonight, he couldn't make it, um, Manny Nasowski. You've, if you do the New York Times, you've, you've seen him. He's created amazing, giant, beautiful, open puzzles by hand, you know? But when you do it, you gotta realize it's gonna take a lot more time. He spends 
on his best puzzles 100 hours making them. So, yes, sir. So, this is an interesting thing because as computers get better at generating grids, which are successful problems, the true cost is getting a cost from creators from selective curators. Yes, that's true. So that's pretty much what I do in my technique. Is I, so the question is a statement about how uh, as computers become better at doing this stuff, people who write these things are basically just curators of stuff that's created by computers. And that, I think, is, is very true. Uh, but humans are much better at sort of pattern recognition, being able to look at higher level um, qualities of the grid that are very hard to program in. So humans aren't done yet when it comes to creating these things. Give it 20 years. Uh, yes? Oh yeah, last question, sir. Uh, there is commercially available cross recreation. It costs about $20 to $60, somewhere in that range. I probably should have done that rather than spending a couple months to build mine. <laughs> but mine does a couple things that other people can't, so you know, it's kind of a wash when it comes to that. All right, thank you very much. And this is the puzzle. You can uh, send hate mail to Charlie and Lauren Paul. Thank you much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is it for tonight. Uh, it seems like the field trip is already selling out. If there are tickets available, you might want to do that soon. We'll leave this up during the intermission, and I hope to see you soon. And one favor before we go, there's someone in the audience whose birthday it is today. So can everyone just say happy birthday, Angela? Happy birthday, Angela! Thank you for being here. Good night, everybody.